Hello, I'm Alan McGuire, and this is Juvenalia, a podcast about childish things. Some pedants might point out that it's actually pronounced Juvenalia, but those people are wrong. Juvenalia is the art that we make when we're young and unformed. Juvenalia is the art that makes us when we're young and unformed. Now that sounds pretentious and made up, and it's true, I did just make it up, and I'm very pretentious. What it basically means is that every two weeks or so, I'll talk to a cool, interesting person about a book or film or TV show or whatever that was important to them as a child and how they feel about it now. So that's the gist of it. Let's go listen to a podcast. Hello, I'm Alan McGuire, a humor editor of Headsoft.org, and this is Juvenalia, a podcast about childish things. Uh, my guest co-host today is Sarah Griffin. She's a writer and a food columnist and general person of the internet of the internet How's it going? person <laughs> of the internet hello yes. How are you? and our guest today is academic and writer of minibelange.com it is Sinead Burke. Hello. Hey. Hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> there we are. I like the way we're all pretending we're not in the one room. It's yeah. like we're having, <laughs> having mad chats yeah. for a while, yeah. you got to be professional, so, guys. Oh, so professional. Yeah. It's the first time we've met. First oh, time yeah. We've met. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wrong um, suits. Yeah. <laughs> it's not flannel in sight. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> we're all well, pretty much all wearing flannel or stripes, so. Yeah. 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 Guts. Yeah. I'm glad we all text each other before this. And, you know. <laughs> Just coordinated. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Passionate yeah. conscious, yeah. So you're going to talk to us about Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Yes, I'm very honoured to be here. Thank you for having me as a guest. And Yay. when I kind of, yeah, it's very <laughs> exciting. And when I heard the idea of the podcast, I loved it. And initially I kind of said something which was Snow White and the Seven Dwarves quite flippantly. I said, this is what I'm going to talk about. This is something that I loved as a child. And afterwards, I didn't know if I should regret it or not and pick something else. I thought maybe, oh, is there something better that I can talk about or something that had more of an impact particularly in my teen years? But I suppose as I started to unpick it, I realized that it's had a, a monumental impact on me in many different forms uh, throughout my entire life from before I was born, if we want to start there. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, let's start with that. Let's so. start there. Go right, for at it. the very beginning. This at is the, the yeah. very the beginning. Prologue. Oh my right. God, I really love this. They open the storybook. Oh wow, so <laughs> we've gone past the, the blue in. castle and yeah. the amazing yeah. music. Okay, Once so we're still out of time. Oh my God, who's going to be Julie Andrews? Me, every day. Thanks, Angela Lansbury. Let's do it. Yeah, I... I don't know if anybody knows who's listening to this, but as you said kindly earlier, I'm Sinead Burke. And I suppose one of the most interesting or different characteristics about me is my height. So I am a little person. I stand at the height of three foot five inches tall. And my family, I suppose, are most different are different in terms of their makeup than most families. So my mother is average height. My father is a little person like me. And my siblings, of which I am the eldest, all four of them are average height. And my mom is Irish. My siblings were all Irish and born here, but my dad is English. And actually, some of the reason why they are together, the reason why they are together is because of Disney. Mm. <gasps> <No. Well> <laughs> <laughs> it's not that magical. Page it's not that <laughs> <laughs> PTO, PTO. <laughs> Well, it's because of the, the pantomime and the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So I think Snow White was first created in 1937. Is it earlier than that? 19 the th- Disney version. Yeah, the Disney yeah. version was yeah. created yeah. in 1937. And you know, from that, lots of books and different things have evolved. One of the things that has evolved from the tale is a pantomime, which you know happens every Christmas in lots of different cities. And it comes to Dublin maybe every five to ten years. And in 1988, I believe it was, if not, it was very close to the late 80s, it happened in the Olympia Theatre in Dublin, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and there wasn't enough little people in Ireland to make up the cast for the Seven Dwarfs, so they got in people from the UK, and one of them was my dad. He was in his very early 20s, he came over with his best friend, who they both met when they were 15, and they were wrestling around the world, they'd been to Dubai, and they'd done all of these amazing things. Dad regularly likes to quote that he has been to Dubai when he was 15 on his own. <laughs> all right. He's quite smug about that, it's, it's good. <laughs> he still is to this day. And he came to Ireland to take part in this show, and he played the character of Happy, he has a, a tattoo of happy on his arm oh. amazing yeah. yes i know my dad is cooler than yeah. i am <laughs> he's, 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 he's really really on, cool yeah. um and i'm i just can't compete i can't compare and they came to ireland to do that show and it was a summer pantomime so a little bit different to dublin's makeup at the moment and he had a great time he worked with amazing people but actually it was in dublin's olympia theater as i said already but my mom was working next door and in between shows because it's a two-show day you get very tired you don't have enough time to go home you should go somewhere quite local to eat and he went to the restaurant next door and himself and my mom met and they they started dating but obviously you know it was only a three month or four month stint they kind of didn't think anything permanent would happen and as my dad was leaving to get on the boat my mom went home packed a bag and followed him to Hollyhead she got on the same boat and he didn't know until 
they were actually physically on the boat in the middle of the Irish Sea. Wow, and uh, they went amazing, to yeah. England and the relationship blossomed. And the poll tax was just about to come in in the UK. So it was a time when Ireland was actually a cheaper place to live than in, <laughs> than in England, surprisingly. And because the poll tax was coming in, they said they'd come back to Ireland and have all of their children and their family here. And they did. And we were all born and exist. And so, yeah, it's had a huge impact on my life since before I was born. I mean, it's the reason why my family came together and are together, I suppose. So, yeah, that's the starting of it. That is so savage. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm never going to have like a relationship that, that ever compares. <laughs> so it, epic. Isn't it? It's like a tale in itself it's like a film in itself yeah i'm, I'm doomed doomed yeah, like they must have seen each other like out on the deck like you have to it was what leonardo was inspired <laughs> by i feel i feel yeah, yeah it was it was kind of of epic proportions mm. imagine how she felt like imagine how her family felt Whoa. Oh yeah! Can you yeah. Imagine? Like I, d- I don't Did know. Did you give warning or? I'd like I imagine. Bye. <laughs> Alaska. I'm bye. Go, bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> Sashay away. <laughs> Onto the boat. <laughs> I love that. Can you imagine RuPaul just bringing you on a boat to Hollyhead? <laughs> I would <laughs> sign up. Sign me up. I'm that in. would be a cruise That's I would it. be on. Yeah. But yeah, I've no idea. She kind of just came home and she kind of packed a bag and said, "I'm going to England," and my nanny brought her to the to the port and she saw my dad my nanny had never met my dad before but he was a little person my nanny said to him are you chris and my dad said yeah and she said she's on the boat waiting for you and uh, yeah so they went and existed and have been together for a long long time now and still very much borderline skip into the happily ever after right (laughs) yeah it's 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 quite phenomenal yeah Yeah, and they've done an amazing thing since they're the founders of little people of ireland which is the organization here for little people they built and developed that and they're still at the head of that and still run an annual convention for over 300 people every year and have cultivated this safe space for little people and their families in Ireland and further afield so yeah they're kind of heroic my that's, their, that's, that's their kingdom yeah yeah, that's it. yeah. they're kind of heroic and so um, uh, yeah Snow White has been integral for my whole existence and I know when I got a bit older my parents not embarrassed me but started to jibe you know when Snow White came on and they'd be like you know you used to watch that every single day as a kid I was like don't joke. And they were like, no. And you used to cry because it was in the era of VHS, ladies and mm. gentlemen, if you are a Generation <laughs> Z <laughs> or below. Like we all are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we've all been there. Everyone yeah. in this room has been It was been a there. thing you had to rewind With in order to use again. <laughs> <laughs> or if you didn't, do you, do you remember the pencil? We had oh to yeah. wind back. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Oh yeah. yes. Oh yeah. So I used to cry and sob until it started all over again. And I don't know. I don't know if I ever saw myself in the film. I don't know if that's what attracted me to it or if it was the bright colors or the music which i know you have some thoughts on sarah mm. but i just loved it i i don't know what it was i don't think i saw the seven dwarfs and the seven male characters and saw myself as one of them i, w- I think i would have been too young to even subconsciously to have analyzed yeah. it at that yeah, level yeah. but i think i just loved the romance of it yeah. and kind of the fairy tale and the plot and, and the world and the mm. world of it yeah. looking back now it's entirely problematic <laughs> 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 it's quite dark like it's visually yeah. quite dark there's a lot of scenes of genuine terror it's sort of yeah. before Disney became heavily sanitised mm. in terms oh, of oh when she lost in the forest at the start oh my god those trees come on yeah. now but like the Wicked Queen herself, I mean, what she transforms yeah. herself into, it's a complete juxtaposition. And I know it's probably deliberately done because mm. Snow White is so aesthetically beautiful, you know, and subscribes to every societal standard when it comes to that kind of definition. And then you look at the Wicked Queen and she has aged dramatically. Mm. She has a false, bumpy nose. She has this big, you know, kind of crooked chin. She's a crone. Yeah. She's yeah. a crow. She and looks she like stares right down the camera at you as well. Oh, yeah, they're, they're her terrifying yeah. fingers. Yeah, yeah. Like it's fourth wall. It's mm. everything. And then she takes something like an apple which is so domestic and so something that every child has in their house. And that's probably why we're all, t- <laughs> we're all <laughs> terrified of fruit and yeah. vegetables. Yeah. <laughs> 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 damn you, Disney, damn no, you. Go to sleep, go to <laughs> yeah. sleep. And, yeah. you know, completely juxtaposed it and morphed it into something really dangerous and deathly. You know, deadly, not in the Dublin sense, but in the everywhere <laughs> yeah. else the sense. The everywhere else the sense. Little, yeah. And yeah, like it was absolutely terrifying and it was so loud. I remember, like even now I can remember the thunderstorms and everything mm. that happened. Mm. And, yeah. the, you know, the metamorphosis. So often with a metamorphosis in a Disney film, it's something beautiful. Yeah. Like you look at Cinderella. You have like all of the fireworks. And you look at, yeah. Yeah, yeah, body, you look at Sleeping yeah. Beauty. But the only metamorphosis and change that happens in Snow White is with the Wicked Queen. And the villain is really put in such a predominant protagonist role mm. that... It's really scary. Actually, as a I watched child. it last night for the first time in years, and it's like its narrative priorities are really off. Yeah, like they spend like an hour on her cleaning a house and getting to know dwarves, and then they just skip over all the action of it. They don't even show her fainting with the apple. 
No, you know? I think that's a, a lot of that is to do with the sort of the animation standards at the time. There's some mm. really amazing videos you can watch of them of the animators sketching a woman who was playing the physical role of Snow White. Yeah, and like drawing from her. It's movement. so lifelike. It's so yeah. lifelike, and, and her body uh, is, in terms of. Um, on, on a previous podcast with Jean Sutton, we were talking about the snaking of women's bodies mm. in Disney and the sort of this really hypersexualization that the Disney animators could make a, a feather duster a sexy thing, you know? Yeah. But Snow White is actually very average, you know? And yeah. she's not uh, her, she hasn't got the big bobbly eyes no, of, of recent no. Disney movies. Like mm. she's very, um, she's, she's stylized in a different way. Absolutely. And I think maybe some of why there's a lot of her moving and a lot of her cleaning the house and doing, and like, uh, my arms are held at a very specific <laughs> position yeah. at this minute. You can't see, but she's mirroring Snow gently, White up yeah. and down the room. Beautifully cleaning things around. A lot of that, I think, came from character study. Oh, absolutely. So it's, uh, all it's, all, it's very dance-like, as yeah. you said. It's almost ballet-like. Mm. And, you know, when you look back now, and, you know, it mirrors the Irish constitution in a sense, <laughs> but Snow White's <laughs> role is in the home, and that's really the only narrative that, you know, Disney, Go sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But it's, yeah, it's a beautiful film, but there are so many problems with it. And I think as I've grown older, I have been more obvious and seen them. And I look back at it now as, as a female little person and I try to find myself in that story. Mm. And I don't know where I will put myself because I don't see myself in the seven caricature caricatures of the seven dwarfs. And, you know, they're so problematic as well in a sense and we keep using the word problematic I know but we have a know. jar yeah. <laughs> we have a simple jar <laughs> but it's real throwing, your throwing fave. scent coins your yeah. it's problematic throwing, yeah. discerning viewers absolutely and you know for me what's interesting what's really quite upsetting is when I look at it now and I see the whole romantic tale unfold but none of those seven dwarfs who she lived with were ever a possibility of yeah, romance never for even her considered. Mm. never yeah, yeah. even mm. considered yeah. and they were all male Mm. So like, you know, all nice, as well. all nice yeah. and they cared for her, you know, they nurtured her, they supported her, they gave her a place to stay, but never once was romance either indicated or kind of ever hinted it's to. It's sort of mm. weirdly toyed at with like Dopey. It's weirdly toyed at with Dopey. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, that they definitely have those feelings for her. Yes, yeah. And yeah. you yeah. worship her. You yeah. question yeah. the vulnerability there and what's mm. been kind of taken advantage of. And yeah, I think when you assess it from a, a disability lens mm. and look at from a disabled community and you look at the way, you know, people with disabilities their bodies are either asexual or sexualized mm -hmm. um i think it's really interesting when you look back at it now and see how it goes and yeah as we were talking about earlier you know i completely fell in love with the tale when i was younger yeah. but i wonder how children you know from different backgrounds those children of color you know how did they watch snow white which was you know a very european centric in terms of beauty ideals and see all of this narrative you know skin as white as snow and mm. this ebony purity. and ivory purity, purity. And where did they fit in? Where do they fit in now? Um, and I know Disney have kind of offered and proffered these other kind of female role models and characteristics to try and adjust and fill that gap. I don't know if they've done it right, but then, you know, you get one where do you, you go you from you there? You get one here and there. But then is it tokenistic? Yeah. And that there are other questions I mean, that we is have great to ask. And like Princess and the Frog is great. And yeah. they are making, a they were for a time making a concise effort, but the last big, big Disney bangers are all identical, identical women again, you know? Yeah. And, uh, Although Big Hero 6, I think did quite well. Oh yeah, Big Hero Six did yeah, really yeah. well. They did. That, yeah. was, that was a great film. That. Yeah, God, but then you have, in the opposite sense, when you have, say, Lupita Nyong'o, who just did Star Wars, and Lupita said that she deliberately asked J.J. Abrams for her skin color to be covered yeah. mm. and for her identity, for her identity to be camouflaged in that sense, because she wanted to be seen as an actress and didn't want the entire conversation to, to be, be dominated, yeah. Yeah. to be dominated by her beauty or her skin color, and she was just an actress. And I think that's a really interesting conversation to have with them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Once the power, mm. once the power was with mm. the individual. Yeah. But I think you know we need to do better as screenwriters and producers and directors to create much more holistic, evolved roles for lots of different voices. Because mm. the world is full of a lot of different people, and like it's just kind of it gets for me anyway as a viewer. It gets to a point where I kind of watch films and I get like face blindness and I'm like I don't know who any of these dudes are I mean is this Chris is this Chris Helmsworth is this is, which Chris is this it's you an know, attractive white man yeah I don't know you all look the same to me and like I just get to a point where like except Zac Efron except Zac Efron oh yeah look except Zac Efron yeah, no have you seen the Baywatch previews no my I haven't my goodness <laughs> oh my goodness there isn't an ounce of fat on him <laughs> beautiful man but I think it's important to tell different kinds of stories I think it's important to do better and I think the world benefits from it at Absolutely. large, you know, and we have a canon and a backlog of films where everybody is, where we're telling the same story again and again and again with the same casts again and again and again. And it kind of gets to a point where I don't know about you guys, but I'm definitely looking at me going, can we move forward, please? Can oh, no, absolutely. Like, I remember being a teenager turning on my TV and wanting to see somebody who looked like me and not mm. having to just talk about 
their experiences of being this size, but to actually give a holistic representation of what their interests were, what their mm. life experience was. What their adventures were. Absolutely. And I yeah. think that's that's really, really important and something that I would love to see more of. But I think as, you know, you look at it's the same in politics. We have 22% of women in Dáil Éireann now. And you would hope that conversations evolve and advance and ideas are brought forward because those sitting at the table have changed. So I hope that there are changing seats in Sony, in Universal, in Warner, in all of these places where those with power are actually challenged to second guess their unconscious biases so that it's not just as easy to ring Chris Hemsworth's agent and say, we have a new Hollywood blockbuster. But instead mm. you go, could we have somebody different for this role? Because, you know, what is it about this? There was a, a film last year called Pixels. Um, yeah, w- Adam, the Adam Sandler film. Adam Sandler was in yeah. it. And, you know, I wouldn't subscribe to every Adam Sandler film. <laughs> yeah. And there was questions about, you know, the objectification of women within it. But Peter Dinklage had a role in it. Oh, that's right, and yeah. I spent 90 minutes sitting in the cinema waiting for the short joke. I was like, it's going to come. Mm. Anytime yeah. now. Yeah. It wasn't mentioned. Really? <gasps> Not once. I left that film going, oh my God, this is incredible. Mm. Now, Peter Dinklage has assumed so much notoriety and fame within the industry now that he himself probably has the power to, buy, yeah. to, to make sure yeah. that that doesn't happen within a script because he can say well if you do it I walk Yeah. but how you know you have to work so hard you have to chip at society's institutions for so long in order to actually a- attain that power to be able to do it but for me I walked out thinking my friends who are little people who are five and six will go to see this adventure film will see themselves on screen yeah. regardless of their gender and go do you know what that could be me and I think that's amazing and I would just love to see more of kind of different voices as we were talking about earlier and different roles represented in kind of the quotidian way that they live and are that's what I'd love to a see a lot of the time I find with little people actors they yeah. tend to be in costumes yes like Willow. Warwick Davis yeah, Willow, yeah. Exactly. Willow's kind of the last my dad's in Willow no Is way he? yeah no way so you know the scene you know with the scene before Willow sets out on his adventure and there's two little people there's Warwick Davis and there's another one and the, the magician or the high wizard says to pick a finger and someone picks a finger and they pick wrong and Mark picks a finger and they pick right. Mm. Well, the person who picks the wrong finger is my dad. No that was one of the first things he ever did. He was too tall for the role of Willow. No he <laughs> likes to say <laughs> it's the first time in his life he's ever been too tall for a role. So yeah, my dad was That's in amazing. Willow. So we have all those photos. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like Willow was a brilliant film, mm. you know, yeah. in its own right. And there was a film before that called Frankie Starlight, which was like an Irish version. And it had Gabriel Byrne, not the TV host, the actor, the actor. Mm. The actor. And that was amazing. Um, and it was a really good film. Um, but yeah, I would love to see more of it. But, you know, I'm often asked sometimes, how do I feel about the little people who take these roles? Like, is it mm. objectification? Should they not take them? Should they do much more serious work? Should they be professionals? And I think that's a really difficult thing to do. I mean, we look at James Franco, we look at Shia LaBeouf, and I'm going, Shia LaBeouf just hired out a cinema to sit there and watch all of his own films mm. and, you know, live streamed it to the entire world. We don't say to every white, mid-class man that you are not allowed to act because you know or you know or we say to Shia LaBeouf or we reprimand him because he portrays a negative impact and negative image to white men across the world we, yeah. we never do that but when it's a microcosm of individuals we we the standards get blown out absolutely yeah. and I think that's unfair if people want to be actors regardless of their size and they have that talent who am I to say no I think go and do whatever it is that makes you happy and gives you yeah. kind of yeah. fun and enjoyment and enthusiasm out of life. I mean, if that's what feeds your appetite, go for it. But I would love to see their roles increase. I would love to see the, the stories the increase. Yeah, yeah. Mm. More. I would love to see them be more prominent and important. Like I would love to see somebody in a soap opera in Fair City, just going about living their daily life. And that's not just for little people, but that's for lots of different voices because we exist in society. Mm. Ta-da! <laughs> Ta-da! Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> she leaps out of a cake. <laughs> a red velvet cake. Red, red velvet, velvet cake. Red velvet cake. Yeah. Velvet cake. That would be messy. Delicious though. But Delicious, yeah. but like messy. It would look gory almost. It Gosh. would look red gory. Cake just everywhere. Oh my God. Yeah. Birth. <laughs> birth. Cake birth. Back to RuPaul, but I'd look like Sharon Needles. Oh my God. Oh yeah. No harm. No harm. Yeah. Oh my God. I saw her in person last week and I am not yet over it. Wow. So jealous. It was, yeah. it was unreal. It was in the Olympia Theatre. The week... Of the four-year anniversary of Alternative Miss Ireland, which brings us on to a good <laughs> next point. <laughs> <laughs> See how I did that? Oh my yeah, god! It was, it was like oh magic. Yeah. It was magic, magic, <laughs> magic, magic, magic. Out of the cake, on uh, the next out one. Out of the cake. <laughs> oh my god, magic. So yeah, you know, I think we've already spoken about kind of Alternative Miss Ireland. If we, if we go back to Snow White, which is kind of the whole point of this podcast in a sense, um, when I was, I oh gosh, was I eight? No, I was younger than that. I was probably 20, 21. I had been to see Mangina Jones, who is Keen O'Brien, who won Alternative Miss Ireland. 
and it was the most amazing thing. I was sitting in one of the boxes in the Olympia Theatre, and he came. She came out for a final number in this amazing. I can't even describe what she was wearing, but it was like this shimmering fabric, and she took everything off on stage, nipple tassels, everything, yeah. and the crowd went wild. And I was standing beside the incredible Shirley Temple Park, and I turned to Shirley and was like, "Is this a competition that I could enter?" And Shirley was like, "Yeah, I I don't see why not." And it was, you know, for the LGBT community. And whilst I'm an ally, I'm not a member. And I kind of came away going, God, that I just it was a feeling that I had in my chest. And I was like, this is the most incredible place. It really felt mm. like a haven. And throughout the following months, it was announced that the following that, you know, the next alternative in Ireland would be the last one ever. And I was like, gosh, will I enter? Will I not? And I really kind of hemmed and hawed about it. And it was a actually what decided it for me was a night out in the George with my friends. We were in college training to be primary school teachers. And I had reserved a table in the George. But if you don't get there by 11, your table goes. We were all girls. This is important fact. This is important knowledge. Fact. Yeah. Important if you knowledge. are not there by 11, your table goes. And I remember saying to them, listen, we need to be on time. Because if we're not and the table goes, that's all fine for you. Because you can stand at the bar and see. I can't. Ah, mm. I yeah. can't actually see the show. And it is really pointless in me going. Because I'll just be in the way for those getting to the bar. We were late, of course. And um, we got in about 20 past 11 and our table was gone, understandably. But I noticed kind of there was a ruckus happening on stage. And even for drag time, the queens were late coming out. But actually what they were doing on stage, they were taking stools out from underneath the stairs and they put them in the fire exit. Sorry for health and safety. <laughs> yeah. And called me over and said, listen, we know you won't be able to see. So please sit on these stools with your friends and enjoy the show. And I remember being really touched by that. Mm. And we sat and watched yeah. the show. And I was just so in love with the narratives and the movement and the dancing and the makeup. And it was just magic. I just thought it was the most amazing element of performance in the world. And afterwards, when the show finished, everybody got up and danced. And I remember being really quite nervous. And like, I'm not a shy person. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can tell. But I'm not a shy person. But I've had some negative experiences in straight clubs where, you know, men with straight men, you know, with a few drinks on them would oh. pick uh, me up yeah. and, you know, oh. put me oh back no. down. And then so they've stood in front of me and unzipped their fly in my face because they oh. think it's funny with their friends. And like, it's just horrid behavior, yeah. horrid behavior. And I remember kind of thinking, how will the gays react to me? Because if it was going to be something similar, I just didn't want to be there. And I was yeah. like, maybe I'll go home early. And I was like, do you know what? We'll see what happens. I'll go for one song. We'll get up. Madonna's Vogue started to play. All I knew right. the entire routine. <laughs> yeah, 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 let's go. Yeah, I knew it. I knew it all. And I was like, do you know what? Sure, we'll just have a good time. And the most amazing thing happened because nothing happened at all. Mm. And I remember feeling so safe and feeling so kind of loved in a strange way because I'd never met any of these people before. So I was like, do you know what? That really cemented and concreted my reasons and my rationale for entering Alternative Miss Ireland. So I said, I'm going to do it next year. I'm going to do it. And you had to put together a seven minute performance and you had to have some narrative and it was all to do with pop music. And it really took me a time, quite a n little bit of time to come up with my idea. And I was like, what am I going to do? And I remembered, I suppose, Snow White. And I knew how much I loved the whole story, story of it, but the difficulties that I had with it in terms of where did I fit in. Mm. And I realized that Walt himself didn't give me a place in the cast. And I said, well, I'll find one myself. <laughs> and I told this story from my perspective. So it opened with me standing on a four foot platform with a seven foot Snow White skirt and Alan Stanford, the brilliant Shakespearean director who I didn't know from Adam and emailed and was like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> hello, <laughs> Hi, friend. Hello. He actually directed one of the pantos that my dad was in when I was oh, a yeah. baby. So he knew my dad. And I said, Alan, you don't know me, but I'm entering this competition in Ireland called Alternative Miss Ireland. I'm doing it for Snow White. Is there any possibility that you would, you know, do a narr narration for me? Would you mind? And he got back to me and he said, yeah, what do you want me to say? And I sent it to him and, you know, he has this amazing booming Boom voice. voice. Yeah. And he sent it to me and it literally started off with once upon a time in a land far away lived a little girl who actually isn't gay. But why did she enter? I hear you all say. Is she alternative? Why, well, yes, she was born this way. And my seven dancers came out as Lady Gaga's Born This Way started. And I sang everything myself. So I rewrote all the lyrics and recorded it all um, in the Axis Theatre in Ballymun and sang everything and kind of rewrote some of the lyrics to suit this, to suit this specific fairy tale. And they came out. They ripped my seven foot skirt down and lifted me down onto the floor. And it was very obvious to 1,600 people in the <laughs> Olympia Theatre that this wasn't an ordinary telling of Snow White. And it was amazing. My mother who was much more shy than I am, but agreed to kind of take part in the whole production came out as ne uh, to came out as the Wicked Queen. And she walked out to Nina Simone's I Put a Spell on You. Oh my God, amazing. Mm -hmm. mm, so that finished the first half. She gave me an apple and I died. And my seven dwarfs, who were all average height, kind of crowded <laughs> around me and they were bereft and very sad. At least they better have been. <laughs> <laughs> Brats. 
and you know that finished and then the second half opened with me in a glass coffin wearing my Deb's dress and they were oh. crying around me they were now in white shirts and little bow ties and it was a mix of kind of male and female dwarfs you know just challenging stereotypes yeah. all the way yeah. And Go full hog. Yeah, yeah absolutely and my glass coffin was made by the man who did the windows in my house yeah, I kind of beg, borrowed, and stealed <laughs> every favour that I could. All the favours. All the favours. And my dad came out dressed as Prince Charming. And he came across the stage. And, you know, he was very sad. And he picked up my hand. And he kissed my hand. And I woke up. And I was lifted out of glass coffin because it was huge. And I was put on stage. And dad sang One Direction's What Makes You Beautiful. I sang Rihanna's We Found Love, but changed the words from We Found Love in a hopeless place to We Found Love on the Olympia stage. And still, to, still to this day, I cannot sing the correct words <laughs> when the song comes on the radio. And strangers are like, what? And it ended with the Black Eyed Peas, I Got a Feeling. And it was just the most amazing moment. And like, I entered because of the experience that I had within the LGBT community, never thinking that anything would come of it, anything would ever happen. You know, I had seen the people who were entering alongside me and the standard was just so high. Yeah. And when the winner was announced that it was Minnie Melange, it was just, which is the stage name that I chose for it, it was the most incredible moment. And I chose Minnie Melange because I had, I suppose, a huge fascin fascination with Nicki Minaj, purely because I have the same size waist as Kate Moss and the same size hips as Nicki Minaj, which is the <laughs> coolest thing that you will ever <laughs> learn about me. Yeah, it's this amazing. Mad facts. Yeah. <laughs> great facts. And I know all of Nicki Minaj's monster verse off by heart, which we're not going to do live in the podcast because we would need <laughs> too many bleeps I'm for it. I'm going to find a moment. I'm yeah, gonna find we're, we're going to do it outside. We're going to do it outside. And I just... I love, I suppose, her power and her voice. And yet there are contentious issues with her too in terms of being a role model, but I just think she's really inspiring. And I mean mm. that in a non-derogatory way. But m to be Minnie Minaj, and Minnie is in kind of a reference to Disney and also a reference to m my height, but Minaj in French, to fait de Minaj, means to do household chores. And I am the least domesticated <laughs> individual that there is in this entire city. And I thought that doesn't really suit my personality. So I needed something else. And the word melange means mix. So that's really how it came about. And mini melange. And yeah, it was the most amazing night of my life. And to see that, I suppose, Snow White was such a, a part of that was really huge. And afterwards, um, you get whoever wins gets the front cover of GCN Gay Community News, the free magazine, the subsequent year. And they said it to me and they said, what do you want the cover to look like? And I was like, oh God, I don't know. Like, will I do something really vogue and fashion and be Anna Wintour? And I was like, no, why not go back to Snow White? So I got my Snow White I'm dress really back on. Googling this cover right yeah, now. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's quite amazing. amazing. And Stephen Byrne, who's, you know, this amazing illustrationist, he put all of these birds around me oh, wow. on my shoulders and on my head and kind of everything. And it was a very traditional, typical Snow White. Um, but we shot it in the Phoenix Park. So I was walking around in my Snow White costume. <laughs> and there was all of these children going, Mammy, why is Snow White so small? <laughs> Mammy was like, shh, shh, don't ask questions. Don't ask questions you don't want the answers to. And yeah, it was. it's an amazing image. I still have it framed and in my house. And uh, it's really, would, really yeah. beautiful. Oh, Sarah's found it. Oh, my God. Sarah's I'm found it. God, She's found mind. it on show the me, internet. Show me, show me, show me, show me, show me. Like... <laughs> It's quite wow, amazing. Stephen did a amazing. really good job with the illustrations. Okay, we'll put so it on the headset. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's amazing. Yeah, and it's kind of been an integral part ever since. And I suppose the the name Mini Melange has transferred to the website that I write. And mm. um, so yeah, it's I've still kind of a really big part in the show, and they are astonishing. Yeah, it was pretty amazing, and it was the whole thing was filmed, and it's featured in Panty's documentary Queen of Ireland, and lots of other things. But it was an amazing, amazing night. The reception that I got. Actually, I'm like going through yeah. the <laughs> like, Oh my gosh, Nate, this is amazing. But it was amazing. And it's been such an integral part of my life. And it was so amazing to have my parents on stage because as it was in the Olympia Theatre, that was the stage that my parents met yeah. on. And to and bring them back. back. Mm. And my sisters were in the front row. My sisters weren't going to go because I had been rehearsing in like in my local college where I went to college. I had brought everybody together. I didn't know the dancers from Adam. Somebody put out a Facebook post said we need seven dancers for this show that's mm. happening. And we got together. And my sisters, I'd been talking about it for so long. And my sisters were like, you know, like what like should we go tickets were all went all the money went to charity but mm. they didn't know if they should go if it was their thing and i said well listen if you can get last minute tickets go but if you can't it's no big deal like nothing's gonna happen i'm just gonna go in there it's gonna be a great night i'm gonna have a lot of fun and they found tickets on twitter using hashtag <laughs> ticket fairy right. that day and they bought tickets and they were in the front row and then when i won they were just so relieved that they didn't miss it mm. yeah. but it was amazing to have most of my family because two of my siblings were too young to be there but it was m amazing to have my mom and dad on stage and yeah to have my sisters in the audience it was kind of incredible yeah. that's, that's, very the context of Snow White, like, that's really very powerful like that's almost yeah. feels m it almost feels mythos like it almost feels yeah. like a very like a very meta experience for Absolutely. life. Like it kind of had to be Snow White. Well, yeah. 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 But as my as my mom said, do you know what I mean? 
who would have known that 20 years prior to it when she was dating my dad that a moment like that would be in her future and in their collective future and in our future that we would all come together on stage as a family unit and do something so powerful you know she didn't know when she followed him back to England how long that relationship would last or if it would so I, for me it was a really important and integral moment to my whole life and that happened in the Olympia is just amazing it's absolutely mm. cosmic w- yeah. with, with yeah. Maureen with waving Maureen, down the back Maureen Grant <laughs> with the high priestess of, of Dame Street Maureen Grant. Maureen Grant is the most amazing woman, Alan. If you don't know her, befriend her immediately. She's in her 90s. And the bar downstairs in the stalls in the auditorium is named after her. She was oh working God. there when she was a teenager. Yeah. And, um, she had many children yeah. during her time working there before it was legal for married women to work. Mm. And she started out as a bartender and then she eventually just, was she, the bar She went on holidays for two weeks every time she wanted to have a child. She'd hide she, them she in hide like boxes. Yeah, yeah, well, she hided the bump. Oh. And it wasn't until the theatre itself didn't know that she was married or anything like that until she fell one night and there was blood and they were really quite concerned. And one of the girls who knew was mm. like, get her up, get her up to go. She, she's, she's the and, they're, and they're like the coom. And, she, and they were like, yeah, she's pregnant. And the management were like, is it one of the bar lads and they're like no, <laughs> no Maureen has married this yeah, is like and her she sixth, has her yeah, sixth yeah, yeah sorry about yeah. that now she's um, an incredible person she's an amazing, amazing. Story, story keeper yeah. just a r- and a really kind spirit I went to her house to interview her for the Extraordinary Women series and my favourite moment was just as I walked through the door I was like how's things she was like fine Bono was in last week I said oh how was Bono she said you know Bono I was, <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like no Maureen no I don't no, I don't no no I don't I know of him and she's like oh I know him I'm like you know everybody Maureen but this, there were photographs of her before there was a big fire in the Olympia there was yeah. photographs that got so if you go into Maureen, Maureen's bar at the back of the Olympia it's lined with beautiful photographs and uh, but that's not even the half of them because someone no. got destroyed but there's photographs of her and Laurel and Hardy that there's amazing and photographs and there's one of the w- on the wall of the Snow White pantomime that my dad was in Stop. but he's actually the only cast member missing because he was uh, on a date with my mum what oh, <laughs> <really>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this is like so he wasn't w- there yeah yeah, yeah so he wasn't yeah. there but yeah it's really kind of powerful and stuff so it's amazing every time I go in dad like makes his way for the photo and he's like look I'm not in it <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like yeah. that's not something to be proud of dad <laughs> <laughs> you should have been in the cast photo I'm like let's not ask too many questions about where you were yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let, let's not ask anything. Let's not ask anything. But yeah, it's been it's been really it's been really powerful, and that was kind of an amazing amazing moment. So by the time you done that, you kind of had different feelings about Snow White to how you yeah. had. Like, when did you stop? Like you watched it a lot. You're, 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 you I remember. watched it a lot when I was really young, and I think then kind of school, I probably took over and homework took yeah. over, and I had less time, you know, to sit there. Over. And yeah. being a teenager takes over. Yeah, exactly. And I suppose my my relationship with Disney evolved. It wasn't no longer Snow White, and I think that's probably because I became more aware of me being a little person yeah. and there being little people on film and them not looking like me. Predominantly, mm-hmm. I'd say because I was female. If I was male, I imagine. I yeah. may have had a different relationship mm. with it um, but yeah it it have really evolved in that way and it's, it's not necessarily something that I reflected on or watched back a lot but I had the music on my iPod like someday mm. my prince will come which is very stereotypical <laughs> and, yeah, you know we were talking a lot about Disney and whistle and while you yeah, work so this, but the, the songs in that I was, uh, I was I'm like I'm mad hell bent to them because they're almost like folk music absolutely and later yeah. Disney's music progressed towards like I, 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 all, I, in all of the Gene Sutton podcasts I'm like it's a banger Disney bangers just <laughs> Disney club bangers you know listen we but will never get over reflection never what a tune the Christina, Christina Aguilera version oh my god heart rending massive oh, pop ballads just. and like huge big dancey happy songs and like in and you'll be in my heart from Brother Bear with Phil Collins that's too much too <laughs> like much the do. emotion that's it. can't it's just I just can't or even like the the gospel music in Hercules like yeah. they're all they're, they're, I will find the music. my way oh my god Stephen Gately lads <laughs> like, you can't <laughs> Stephen Gately in the room the like. but um but Snow White being sort of at the dawn of the Disney Empire the music is very it, the music could have existed before Disney. It has oh, a different absolutely. relationship to the film than the later yeah. ones. Because it's, it's not for selling a soundtrack album. No. no. It's for this film. It's not story. something yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not something you would find world. on Spotify yeah. and listen back. Because mm. even when I was putting together all of the music for Alternative Miss Ireland, you know, I tried to mix and do everything myself. I for my dad walking in across the stage to kiss my hand, it was the original Snow White music. It was one day my prince will come, mm. you know, and the instrumental. But when you listen back to it, it sounds like something almost from the Baroque era. Yeah. Mm. You know, it's not something that you would think was in the 20th century. It sounds much, much earlier than that, like it you said. It could have existed independently of animation. Yeah. yeah. And there's something that breaks, uh, in a way with the film, it honours the fact that it's a, it's a fairy tale. Like, it's a, oh, it's a folk tale. It's a tale of the people. Like, I mean, is it Hans Christian Anderson? It's, no, it's Brothers Grimm. It's Brothers yeah. Grimm. Yeah, there yeah, you yeah. go. But yeah. that's, like, you want, mm. you want to tell us all the time, like, you know, yeah. and uh, they, I think... 
it speaks very much to a different a different world and a very strong sense of magic and fairy tales and Absolutely. This, is, this is a this is like a a fable this is in isolation of the world that we live in and i don't think disney cinema has been like that since which is no no no, no criticism yeah. but it is very much but I think it was for it's that moment, yeah, yeah. but has really kind of responded to other generations. Like I think if I sat down in Nice or, you know, if I was in the classroom teaching again and put Snow White on, they would still be very swept up, I think, yeah. in mm. the magic of it, re- regardless of how society has evolved. Yeah. And, you know, we were talking about pantomimes and stuff earlier, and I suppose thinking back and realizing just how monumental an impact the film has had on me two through to three years ago gosh i can't remember i'm getting old and can't remember timelines <laughs> it's, all it's, all yeah. it's all blur it's all blur it's all gray hairs it's, a, it's just i've just clicked stop it's just it's happening so i'm aging i'm aging um, we all are and we all are eye cream um but yeah i did pantomime three years ago in in dublin in the gaiety theater this time and it was my first time ever to do a panto i had a brief stint on stage when i was 16 i was in transition year and i did some work experience in the grand opera house in belfast this beautiful historic theater and i was helping out in every part snow white was actually on at the time and i was helping out in every part of the theater i was doing the lights i was doing it was just an amazing experience to get and on my last day i suppose the crew behind the stage said do you want to go on stage (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, do I want to go on stage? Yes, I want to go on stage. And literally they brought me into costume. And because obviously the Seven Dwarfs all had their costumes, they literally put bits of things on me to make <laughs> up some sort of costume. And they said, okay, you're going to go out into this next scene. But nobody knows. The Seven Dwarfs don't know. Snow White doesn't know. The Prince doesn't know. And we're just going to put you out. And you're just going to have to ad lib. And they're going to have to ad lib. And the true spirit of Pandemite. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So there was eight dwarfs went out on stage and the narrative was that you know during the interval things happened between Snow White and Prince Charming and ta-da <laughs> <laughs> obviously biology and how all of that works is magic yeah. it's yeah. magic it's, it's fine magic. storks storks storks, yeah. storks are in Belfast oh, so <laughs> many storks <laughs> showed up <laughs> <Yeah. in the laughs> ball. it was chaos Man, backstage the cabbage patties <laughs> full of these red velvet cakes it was everywhere <laughs> it was everywhere and that was amazing and that was kind of my first stint in terms of being on stage for a pantomime and then it came up in the gaiety and there was you know audition and they wanted a mix of kind of local cast and those from the UK and I'd never done it before and I suppose one of the reasons why I hadn't done it before was predominantly because I was female and when you look at a lot of panto casts there was no real involvement in the script but also a lot of directors if you're female prefer you to dress as male they kind of want to silence that element of your identity Mm. to reflect and mirror the original Disney tale because they feel it's what children will expect and also in the tradition of pantomime there's a lot of drag absolutely Mm. so there's the dame and then there'll be buttons who is invariably my grandmother played buttons a lot in panto I'm from I'm from a panto family also yeah. and um, my uh, shows your panto roots Alan shows your panto roots where are your panto roots in a show in transition year that's oh it. you're fine you're past that's, yeah. that's fine past you can stay you can stay that's doing business without really trying Oh, yeah. yeah, amazing. That's a good show. I yeah. was, the only role I've ever played on st- musically on stage was Kinnicky in a, in a oh my gosh in a 15 oh, wow. I love Kinnicky I have one song line did you get very far? Aha, do do, aha, do do. Thank you. Well, well Mike, drop yeah. the mic. <laughs> yeah. I was real proud. And I was in drag, so nice. very pleased with myself. Nice. But yeah, um, I was always, not necessarily, I don't think I was uncomfortable with the drag element mm. of it because, you know, I love nothing more than a bit of drag yeah, on the drag fantastic. stage. Yeah. But I think it was the fact that, I suppose, I don't know if it, if it was because I felt silenced or if I felt like my gender wasn't important in the role. And I was just kind of deeply uncomfortable with mm. that I had to be male in order to be valid or important for the show. Certainly. Mm. And I remember having a discussion with the director beforehand, you know, before kind of auditions and stuff and said, you know, how do you visualize the whole production coming together? And he said, well, if you want to be female, if you want to be you and you get the part, well, then we'll make that happen. And I remember being really enthusiastic about that. And I was like, oh, my God, I have so many ideas. <laughs> Let's go, so many ideas. <laughs> and he was like, steady. <laughs> and it was amazing. You know, my dad, um, it was the first time I suppose I've worked with him on a stage that large. My dad played the doc character. He was th- in charge of the seven. And I played Bangles. Because if it, it ain't got no bling, it don't mean a thing. And I had <laughs> lots of sass and lots of attitude. But what was, um, like, so fulfilling and endearing for me about that role was that the director and the scriptwriter and the producers really worked together to bring it, I suppose, to a different level. And no longer was I this kind of passive character among the seven who, you know, just helped and cleaned. But I turned into Snow White's confidant and her best friend. Oh, so it was this amazing cool. sta- scene yeah. on stage where it was just Snow White and she was kind of talking to herself and I was behind one of those, you know, like a, a Japanese changing screen. Yeah. There's mm. official word for that. 
we're going to call it a Japanese changing screen yep. for the purpose of this podcast. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll, just, we'll just do a bit Alan's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> going, here is the technical term <laughs> yeah. of the screen. I love that. I love that. And I was kind of standing behind it and she was kind of talking and she turned to me and she said, are you ready yet? And I jumped out from behind it and was like, ta-da. And actually what I was wearing was a um, complete miniature version of her dress. Mm. So the costume department within the Gaiety Theatre had made yeah. an exact replica. That's and savage. we had this amazing moment on, s- on stage where we were both looking into each other's eyes. And Snow White was kind of confiding that she was nervous about meeting the prince. And when you look back in that whole film, you realise, God, how terrifying must it have been for this young girl that her whole life is set up to, you know, meet this beautiful man who she's never met before and it's almost like something arranged, but, you know, it's it's not arranged and she's going to meet him, or at least she thinks she will, and she's going to spend the rest of her life with him and she has no idea what she's where like. Where are her mates? Uh, yeah, yeah, where are her mates? <laughs> where where yeah, is your squad? I was her mate. I was her mate. <laughs> yes. I was the Taylor. No, I wasn't Taylor. <laughs> I'm not going to put myself up for being Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be Beyonce. We'll have a formation, but th- that's problematic too. <laughs> <laughs> I need to think. Problematic jar. Problematic jar. <laughs> Money and all of the, pro- in the, but, the problematic jar. But the but the interesting thing about that is that in these amazing pieces of mythology about women uh, within Disney, and while the larger culture culture of Disney, as speaking as a, a person who has been to the parks and has lived that life, and who would would very very happily continue to go, <laughs> uh, love love it to death. They part of your past. There is no judgment here. Oh, there is no on, judgment it's here. It's the business. No. It's a small um, world. My haven. It is a small <laughs> world. <laughs> <laughs> Got my mom a cup from there. Oh, look. Anyway, um, within the sort of wider umbrella of Disney, they sort of like to market that all of the princesses are like pals. Yeah. yeah. Who all hang out and have princess time together. But in isolation in their own quests, none of them have any girlfriends. No. I mean, like, mm. Sleeping Beauty has the three uh, fairies but who are... But they're more with themselves and she's a separate entity yeah. rather than... No, like, here's a frock, kind of. Yeah. 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 Jasmine has a tiger. Jasmine, Jasmine has, has a tiger. Really yeah. good. I, I would like, love I, a good tiger. I'd, yeah. I'd be pals with a tiger. Yeah. You know, Aladdin got a carpet. I would take the tiger. <laughs> tiger I would anyway. take it. And like they didn't think about that, the patriarchy. <laughs> I, guess, I guess Ariel had flounder and yeah. Sebastian, and they all have these beautiful tiny creature friends or whatever. But it's again, but they're but it's actually, kind of Tiana had a girlfriend. Tiana had a girlfriend, uh, but that's only quite recent. In yeah, a sense. that's mm. super recent. But then you have Frozen, and they were sisters. And for me, that's such a powerful film mm. because you know, so Same. often we are told by Disney that true love only exists between a man and a woman which is problematic in terms of the LGBT community in itself but then you see something as powerful like sisterhood being what breaks the bond and the spell in Frozen yeah. and for me you know as you know, brilliant as Let It Go was and Idina Menzel is it's a banger <laughs> it's a banger <laughs> it's, it's a banger, a banger. <laughs> country and western banger by the way when I first started I remember sitting in the cinema like you know when you're like physically drowning in your own tears and you're ugly crying by that stage in the film I had just surrendered any sense of dignity I was just like I'm just going to wail for a while yeah. mm. but when that song first start, started it up little did any of us know really back then how what, what how the song was going to be or little yeah. did any of us know how you know John Travolta was going to absolutely yeah. mangle <laughs> oh my god and damn the same what was that you just <laughs> said but the culture that, that, that spawned from it was so we did we knew nothing at the time we first saw it but I initially heard the song I was like that sounds like a country song yeah. It's actually a real, it's got loads of country and western vibes. In it. Now, li- next time you hear it, think about it. Like, we do it in choir, so I've heard that, I've sang and heard that song hundreds of times. Oh my on god, stage. Alan. Yeah. Sing for us. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I got really excited there. I was like, oh my god. Yeah, because when we started a choir, um, there weren't enough men. So I'm a, like a bassy baritone by nature, but I had to go into tenor. Oh wow. And it's, let it go, it's so high. It's, it's so high. So high. For, for it man, is. you have to shout it like so. There's no way I'm doing it in a tiny room here with curtains and, and like mega yeah, soundproof yeah, and like the yeah. mics are just be like. I don't know what you're talking about. We are in an absolute massive mansion in the middle of rural. Oh, yeah, no like eight, <laughs> eight engineers, producers, everything. We around. each had stuff yeah. manor of <laughs> South County. We Dublin. each have a flat white and macarons. <laughs> oh they are gosh. on the table in front of us. But yeah, that moment on stage was so powerful because for me it really elevated the role, of particularly of the seven, and it gave, I suppose, a. a a purpose for a female character even to exist within that formula but we had a moment where I sang a song so I remember the producer and the director coming to me and he said can you sing and I was like oh it depends. I was like, <laughs> I, could. I was like, what? What's the song? And do you mean Adele sing, or do you mean Hold a Note sing? And he said, No, can you sing? And I said, Well, what's the song? And he said, Have you watched Sweeney Todd the musical? And I said, Yeah, I've seen it. And he said, There's a song in it called Nothing's Gonna Harm You, and um, and it's a beautiful, dainty song that's mm. really high, and it was literally about me singing to Snow White that regardless of what happens with the prince, that I, as her friend, would be the one to protect her. Mm-hmm. And it was this amazing moment written in to the story um they made a room yeah 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 they did and they made space and i really i think i did good a, a good job and helped filling that space and the response from the audience because initially you know producers and directors were concerned they were like we've gone you know we've skewed from the tail a little bit we're not sure how 
young cast members or not necessarily cast members but young audience members will feel about this if they'll respond because it doesn't mirror what they know mm. but the response was huge like it was absolutely huge like little girls coming up saying you know oh I have a dress like you bangles because they had a mini snow white dress and it no longer became snow white's dress but it was bangles dress it was oh. our yeah. dress it was, it was our yeah. dress yeah. and everybody felt a bit of ownership in it because they could see somebody they could relate to right now and somebody they could relate to in a few years yeah. absolutely yeah, when yeah. they were an adult and it was just so powerful I loved it it was four m- amazing, tiring, draining, brilliant, enthusiastic months it w- with the best people. Like we grew into Panto a family. Has, Panto has such power like that. I feel. Such oh power. Yeah. And, and I th- think, it, like, it, I think it's undervalued. Like it w- is. within a mass in terms of the talent that it requires. Here is where a class intersects. Yeah, <laughs> she says again. Yeah. But it really does. It is. A, it's a. I won't wake in the feminist for Panto, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's a popular star form, you yeah. know, mm. and like oh, it's a. Yeah. Uh, the panto that I was reared around was always in like the local community theatre and like John Player Tops and all this kind of stuff. Like mm. I, I had a couple of little potter on and off the stage roles myself, but I was never like in it and it my grandmother was. But it um I feel Panto's role for queering traditional narratives, even if all of the pantomimes do kind of every year we're gonna see some approximation of now the last year was frozen or like Snow White yeah. you know, or, or Snow White or like Sleeping Beauty or the Great Princess Tales. Al Porter's Freezing is still my favourite. <laughs> I'm sick I, I didn't see it. It's it's just my favourite. Even the idea like the title of it. Yeah. I just yeah. every like, time so I think dumbing. of it I, every time I think of it I laugh and I'm like Al Porter, you guy. <laughs> genius. You're, you're genius so funny. Like but like part of that is part of that is class and part of it is like yeah. it's, it's event theatre and it's one of the It's accessible. It is but it's really local. Massive, it's very yeah. local. Yeah. The massive power that it holds within that accessibility and within that locality and within that class stuff is that it also massively queers major historical narratives and yes. major like old texts and like there's always a, there's always a dame and there's yeah. generally a buttons of some description and that's very important absolutely and there is room within panto to break things and the people who see that panto like those kids yeah like they're the ones who it will really matter to well i met somebody recently and it was on it was on a press trip and we were talking and somebody said something they were like did you do panto three years ago they were like oh my god i saw that you <laughs> saw that yes and like that sounds really narcissistic which it is. No, it's it's really, but, yeah. but it goes back to that whole thing about the importance of panto and i think why panto is so important and like any other kind of stage production is because the, your extra character is the audience the audience are a cast mm-hmm. member you walk He's out on behind onto, you but you walk out onto that stage depending on the reaction you get from that audience depends yeah. on your performance because mm. you go out there and if the crowd are feeling it my god do you put on a show if you go out there and they are barely interested in what's happening on stage the energy is just not the same but you want to go out there and give them the best we did a scene with them um, the magnificent seven as we called ourselves mm. um, but we did like the great british bake-off so we all made cakes and then we did like th- in like diversity but we did dwarf versity, and I played Ashley Banjo. <laughs> Poor Ashley Banjo will be absolutely horrified because he's about <laughs> six, eight, six, nine. And we did this amazing, like, full choreographed routine, you know, and it was phenomenal. But, like, the kids came away going, oh my God, you can dance, you can sing. And no longer were we, you know, stereotypically defined with this one passive role, which was to aid another or to be the plot device mm. in order for the story to carry on. It was like, no, we are actually. Active people yeah important like it's possible to find proper yeah. spaces for yes. people the, like which didn't happen in snow no. white and huntsman absolutely which you want to talk about. yeah w- you know there's been huge involvement i think from snow white in some ways and there haven't and you know there's been two very big films you know one with lily collins and she played the role of snow white and julia roberts played the queen and that was quite it was beautiful it was mm. well shot lily was a great kind of passive snow white and julia roberts was a much more accessible queen and then there was snow white and the huntsman with Kristen stewart who came out you know onto set in armor like an absolute warrior in Joan of Arc and then there was Charlize Theron who was the most terrifying person I have ever seen on screen as the <laughs> Wicked Queen yeah. oh my god yeah, yeah. she's amazing but there was a piece of music which coincided with her entrance and it's called um, Breath of Life and it's by Florence and the Machine and mm. it's this big orchestral textured work that you listen to it and it gives you goosebumps and it just you know I suppose surmises all of her power but for me one of the most I suppose disappointing thing of that film was the CGIing of little people. So little people were hired for the Seven Dwarfs. They were brought and they were filmed, but then tall people, much more famous people, were CGI'd onto their bodies. So we had Toby Jones, I think Brian Gleason was one of them, and there was lots of these other people who were CGI'd as the Seven Dwarfs. Obviously because, you know, the production, the film production house thought that the only way to make people interested in this film was to have as high profile characters as possible who are good actors. And for me, that was disappointing because, you know, there's fabulously talented little people 
I mean, the fact who that Mirror Mirror cast little people proves yes. to at least seven people capable of doing those roles. I mean, I could name yeah. the seven off the top of my head in one county here in Ireland, regardless of yeah. the rest of the world, because when you're little, you have access to that, mm-hmm. you know, network across the world. But what was disappointing for me was that nobody was talking about it. Like, yeah. it was nowhere. No critic stood up and said that, not even that it was wrong, because I don't know if it was wrong, but actually made it a focus of the film or made it a conversation point and said, actually, you know, would we stand for this if this was a different disability, if this was a different minority voice? Would we allow this to happen from other communities? Mm. And perhaps it's my own biases and my own, you know, kind of subjective nature, my own personal feelings, but I don't know if we would. You know, we talk about Eddie Redmayne all the time, who is a wonderful, fantastic actor, but we talk about him being a vehicle and a platform for other people's stories. You know, we, we, you look at what he did with Stephen Hawking, you look at what he's doing with the trans community at the moment, and he's getting great acclaim, which is very well deserved because he's a very talented actor. But we are still having conversations going, is this right? Should we have had somebody from the disabled community take part mm-hmm. in that film? Should we have somebody from the trans community much more involved in that film? And I think that's really important that we're having those conversations. But for me, what was disappointing with Snow White and the Huntsman was that we didn't even talk about it. But the new film is out soon with Snow White out of the title yeah. um, for reasons that we probably <laughs> shouldn't bring yeah. forward. Nonsense reasons. Nonsense frankly. reasons. Nonsense, nonsense reasons, behavior. But legal Shen- reasons that we probably shouldn't <laughs> discuss. Yeah. Absolute shenanigans. Shenanigans. Sh- shenanigans. That's shenanigans. No. Christian shenanigans. Like, yeah. boo. Like, boo. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, she's no longer in it and we have Chris Hemsworth is back as the Huntsman. We have Charlize Theron. Oh my God, I'm so excited. <laughs> back as the Queen. But Emily Blunt has a new role. So she is a sister of Charlize Theron in this new one apparently. Um, so it should be, she's like a snow queen or an ice queen or something. I'm very excited. I have yeah. much love for Emily Blunt <laughs> ever since I've... <laughs> it's like frozen meat Snow White, a snow queen. Yeah. No way. Ever because since we have a lot of stuff with snowflakes on it we got to sell guys. Let's go, let's do this. Ever since know? I heard about Emily Blunt and her sister who is married to and Emily introduced them oh my god he's in the Devil Wears Prada with her what is his name he got the Volta Award at the film festival oh my god no 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 we know his name we know his name it's on the tip of our tongue we're almost there oh my god quick 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 podcast is ticking huh John Krasinski no that's who she's married to oh sorry okay her sister is married to he plays in the Devil Wears Prada oh my god people are screaming at us listening to the podcast they are screaming at us Anne Hathaway Meryl Streep Emily Blunt Stanley Tucci yes Stanley Tucci (laughs) yes so Emily Blunt's sister is married to Stanley Stanley Tucci Tucci. because she introduced them I think Emily Blunt is quite amazing I saw her in Into the Woods and I thought she was really it's talented. Was that is a musical, also, isn't yeah. it? Yes, yeah. sometimes, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yes, and James Corden is in it. He's not bad in it. Meryl Streep is in it, though. I loved the joke from Tina and Amy at the Emmys last year. She was like, you know, Meryl keeps doing all of these films and putting like adequate actors around her so that she gets the Oscar. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god, that's Did amazing. Say, Streep was in. Uh, Mama she was Mia, in Mamma Mia, yeah. and it was. I have a lot I of really strong Abba yet. feelings, yeah, so it, it I will fight you. I will fight all it of you just for it. Oh, I mean, it is trash on fire. Like, it is <laughs> It is glittering, beautiful garbage. It is so bad, but it's so good. But so see, I, I see Pierce Brosnan in it, and I'm like, oh, Pierce. And he didn't I, read the script, you know. He didn't realise that it was a musical. And then I follow him on Instagram, and I'm like, what a man. Have you followed Pierce Brosnan on Instagram? Have I? I am oh my wild God. Idea, my friend. Like, I have definitely shared screen caps Essays about his recently. mother. Essays about his I'm wife. I'm really glad that you're there for the essays, my friend. Are you there? <laughs> like, that's what I'm there for. Oh, well, you should see my photo of me and Piers, age seven. Shut no up. Way. So it was a film called The Nephew, and I was on set. I was an extra on it, and I had a Barbie Walkman, so it was pink and purple, because that's what I was... I think I got it just before my communion, or I bought it out of my communion You know, I money. think I remember that Walkman. I know I the ones of the top yeah. of the And time. I was on set, and like obviously it was you have to be on set for so long and so early, and I was really tired. Really ti- yeah, yeah bad. but yeah. I have a Polaroid photo signed by Piers, and I'm sitting on his lap, and he, you know we got the photo, and then he noticed that I was yawning, and he was like, is she tired? And my dad was like, yeah, it's been a long day. And Pierce was like, let her sleep in my trailer. And dad was like, I don't know, it's okay. And Pierce was like, I won't be using it like for all day. She can take a sleep in my trailer. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have slept in Pierce Brosnan's bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it, my drop. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that is so good. I'm going to sit there scrolling through Zingo. There we go. The one the episode. There we go. Uh, whatever. Sarah Griffin did it. She did it. She swore, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Every time. You have to maintain her explicit rating on it. Oh, I see. So you yeah. get one you get one solid swear word. Fuck. And yeah. then you get one and that's but it. Then you yeah. just you, did two. You better do. There you go. Oh my god! Yeah. Can we do we have to like do we have to like contact the authorities? Are we gonna get censored? Yeah. Oh, will you bleep really? it? Yeah. Oh my god! Will you bleep that one? That would be bleep bleep one. One. Yeah, please bleep, bleep that one. one. Okay, bleep yeah. that one. Oh my god! Also, how do they know? Also, Shay, do you want to do one? Do it. We'll get it bleeped. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even sound like me. That was a terrible expression. You I, came from your the core. Pressure, the pressure on that. I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Swear well, swear I, thoroughly. Yeah, how should I internet my voice? What character should I pursue? <laughs> and then it was just weird. Those bleeps are going to resonate across the internet, man. We're gonna oh, yeah. They're going to resonate. This is the moment. Yeah. This is the moment. But yes, yeah, so Snow White has been a huge part of my life. And I hope that it kind of lives on away. I don't know if I'll ever do Panto again. I think doing it without my dad would be really strange because it was so important to me that mm. he was there. And you know, he really kind of guide throughout it. Yeah, yeah, and he really looked after me, and everything was like, "Oh, do you know how to do your makeup?" I was like, "I've been doing this before." You know, <laughs> I actually haven't been doing makeup before. He has the long-running joke in my family was that we would get into the car on our way to school, and Dad would be the one to turn around to us and be like, "Your foundation is patchy," oh, yes! <laughs> and our friends would be in the car and they'd be like how does your dad know what that means? And dad's like, your concealer is all over the place. That's not where <laughs> you're supposed to put it. And our friends would be very kind of concerned by that. But our dad had a makeup bag that was bigger than all of ours put together since we were growing up. That was just life. So it would be very strange, I think, to do it without him because yeah. it was a really special moment. But yeah, Panto is just so full of energy and love. It's and vital. It's vital. And I would love to see, yeah, it would be amazing. I'm looking forward to seeing how the next kind of involvement of Snow White films grow and develop it would be lovely to see something happen particularly within the seven dwarfs and to have space for them and space mm -hmm. for different voices like how amazing would it be to have a dwarf of color or you know a non-straight dwarf you know yeah. it would be mm -hmm. really amazing because those people exist their lifestyles exist and yeah. um, so that would be something really important for me to see and for it to evolve and then to see little people exist in society and be represented in media and in film and television and yeah i think people are doing it like warwick davis and peter dinklage i think amazing people have gone before them and like Albert Reynolds and lots of people and like we're that. We're all standing on the shoulders of one another. Yeah, yeah. you know Peter Dinklage has just won two Emmys and he's hosting or has just hosted Saturday Night Live it's on a April second. Fabulous, fabulous photograph of him holding Maisie's. Um, uh, I'm not a massive. I stopped watching Game of Thrones after season one because I am a delicate little flower. Oh my god, it's so violent! I'm just like I just yeah. can't watch it. This. I'm like, please stop making me like you and then murder. I just I'm a delicate little flower, and uh, there's an there's an amazing photograph. Um, of uh, Arya Stark is in, is in it and she has this beautiful little handbag of a tiny penguin like a little beju or a bejeweled little bird like an actual penguin yeah, oh no, no like a bejeweled little oh, I, I wish I was like really oh my god, god. That'd, be, that'd be me at the I end I was like I'm gonna like start watching Game of Thrones <laughs> my penguin but she has like a beautiful little purse and uh, Peter Dinklage obviously took home an award and in the photos the cast photos he gave it to her to carry and he, ins he instead is carrying her bag yeah and it's lovely it's he really seems quite amazing he has a, yeah. a daughter I think and he's married to somebody who's advertised I've never met him I don't think he has much involvement with the little people community kind of holistically mm. but he's doing great things I mean it's really interesting to see who will follow in his footsteps and kind of what way he has helped to pave much like Warwick Davis but I think they've, they're coming to the point in their career with where they have an power. authoritative respective yeah. voice mm. and they have power to make change and I really hope that that change influences not just their roles but the, the roles, roles of others yeah um, certainly and you know if they're able to make change in a film for them that's great but I would love to see that kind of ripple effect occur so that other people can kind of come up through the system and say do you know what this change has already happened let's not try and break the wall again that would be amazing I think that's a good place to leave it <laughs> that's thank you so much Sinead Burke thank you so much for having me go I love it go and read all Sinead's because Sinead's an amazing interviewer so go read her interviews Alan's one is coming up soon as is Sarah's psst, oh maybe psst, okay. psst, psst, psst. and thank you to Sarah Griffin for <laughs> helping us out and thank, thank you, you and bye bye bye, bye. bye. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>